हेलो गाइस वेलकम टू द नेक्स्ट सेशन ऑफ इंटीग्रेटेड सीरीज फॉर योर नीट एंड नेक्स्ट एंड टुडे आई थिंक यू विल बी वेरी हैप्पी टू सी द टॉपिक व्हिच हैज बीन रिक्वेस्टेड बाय सो मेनी पीपल एंड दैट्स व्हाई आई थॉट दैट आई विल डेफिनेटली कम अप विद दिस टॉपिक बिफोर द एडवेंट ऑफ नीट पीजी 2021 एंड दिस टॉपिक इज एक्चुअली इंटीग्रेशन बट a topic which is uh, basically taken by the ophthalmologist so i have tried to incorporate all the important things of ocular pharmacology and toxicology and we'll be talking uh, it in terms of the ophthalmology and i think um, we will certainly expect some questions from this aspect because if you see the last year aims paper also they had asked about obviously pharmacology was asked but they had asked one or two questions related to the ocular pharmacology per se so let's begin with this amazing topic ocular pharmacology and uh, toxicology right okay so uh, i'll first take the very basics what is actually pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics let's revise our basics and then we'll move forward so if you go with the pharmacodynamics it is actually the effect of the drug so uh, if i talk about the biological and the therapeutic effect of the drug how that drug is actually acting pharmacodynamics dynamics means activity pharmaco means drug so uh, i always have this habit of teaching by splitting the words i think uh, even if you forget the meaning you can quickly split the word and uh, the answer is in front of you so it is you you can say just the mechanism of action of that drug okay now if i talk about most of the drugs they act by binding to the regulatory macro molecules so these macro molecules are available in the form of neurotransmitters or we have the hormone receptors or the enzymes now if the drug is working at the receptor level we have got three levels either it is uh, um, the neurotransmitters or it is the hormone receptors or it is the enzymes so if this drug is acting at the receptor the two things can be there either we have a agonist effect or we have a antagonist effect all right right now if the drug is acting at the enzyme level so it either it can activate it or it can inhibit it so either we were having the agonist and antagonist or here we are having either the activator or the inhibitor right now coming to the next one next is your pharmacokinetics now if you see the pharmacokinetics there is a small mnemonic that you can easily remember that is your adem so what is actually pharmacokinetics all about it is a d e n m a is adsorption then we have got d for distribution we have got the E E is the excretion of the drug and M is the metabolism. So while pharmacodynamics was just the mechanism of action of the drug, the pharmacokinetics means <coughs> how it is taken up in the body, about the adsorption, about the distribution, about the excretion, and about the metabolism. Right? Now a drug can be delivered to the ocular tissue. Now let's talk about these drugs in terms of the eye. so when i am giving this drug to the eye i can uh, be giving it locally or i can be giving it systemically now let's talk about locally locally what are the things you know you know the eye drops you know the ointments we know the injections okay periocular injections intravitreal injections intracameral injections and then systemically when we give the drug systemically either it is oral or it is your iv route right so these are the different things now let's talk about the drug delivery in the eyes i think this is a very important part because uh, in all the organs we do not have so many routes of the distribution of the drug as we have in the eye okay so uh, one very very common thing is your topical drugs yes of course i can give the uh, drops i can give the ointments i can give the gels okay now last time in the aims there was a question that uh, a drop is prescribed to the patient and also a ointment is prescribed so what should be the order nurse has come and she has to give the drugs so what order she should follow 
the ointment followed by the drop, drop followed by the ointment, both side by side or you are first using the drop, wait for 15 minutes, then the ointment. So basically they want you people to have the practical knowledge also, not only what is available in the books. So nowhere it is written in the books that uh, how many minutes you should wait after instilling the drug or you should give them side by side. But this is common sense and comes by practical knowledge. When you have worked in the wards, you have seen the, in, uh, the patients, you have visited the OPD, something like this. Now if you compare here, we have got three consistencies, drop is particularly the liquid, then I have an ointment and a gel. So gel is obviously a semi-solid and ointments is a again you know uh, thicker. So we have more viscosity. So if I have a choice between a drop and ointment, I won't give ointment first. Obviously I will give drops first and uh, if it is you know feasible if I have time then I will give the drop I'll wait for some time and then I'll give the ointment so that I am giving enough time for the absorption of the drop. Second important thing ointment we usually prefer to give during the night times. What is the reason? This is thicker consistency, increased viscosity so obviously its effect will be there for a longer time. So it, during during the night why I cannot expect the patient or his guardian, his or her guardian to be actually instilling the drop very very frequently it becomes cumbersome and inconvenient. I can easily prescribe the ointment at that time so that patient can use the ointment and it can uh, carry on its effect throughout the night. The third important thing is that because it is thicker in consistency, it is also going to blur the vision. And due to that blurring of vision, patient may have problem in doing day-to-day -day life activities during the day. So it's better that you instill that ointment when the patient is asleep. So these are the practical things that you should know between the drops, the ointment and the gels. All right. Now coming to the second thing that is your periocular injections. So periocular injections may if you see we can give the subconjunctival injections we can give subtenon injections uh, I think this is a misprint it is the subtenon injection then we have got the peribulbar injections retrobulbar I think peribulbar and retrobulbar you must have already uh, known because we have the anesthesia where we are giving the peribulbar anesthesia retrobulbar anesthesia so that is behind your muscle cone or uh, you are giving uh, in these paribulbars heard this, heard this word because though it is one of the entity but not very very common not very very uh, successful but yes intracameral means inside the chamber uh, if I talk about the vitreous see we have got two segments one is anterior segment one is posterior segment so posterior segment uh, cavity is called as the vitreous cavity so if I am giving the injection inside this vitreous cavity that is your intravitreal injection what if I want to give the injection in the anterior segment. So there I have got two chambers, anterior chamber, posterior chamber, I can give intracameral. So anterior intracameral, posterior intracameral and then we have got the intravitreal injections, right? And then finally I have got the systemic drugs. So in the systemic drugs I can give the oral ones, I can give intravenous injections also, intramuscular injections also. So I think oral, intravenous, intramuscular is very well known to you. Intravitreal also you guys know. Uh, subconjunctival injections, peribulbar, retrobulbar, drops, ointment, gels, you know. One of the important things which uh, I think uh, most of you must not be knowing is the intracameral that I have told you. All right. Now, let us see and concentrate on the factors that influence the local drug penetration into the ocular tissue. What are those factors which are actually responsible and which are actually uh, influencing that how much the, of the drug is actually penetrating into the ocular tissues. So the first important thing is the drug concentration and the solubility. So um, we know that uh, the drugs are available in the market of different concentrations. So when I require the better penetration, I am using the more concentration. Higher the concentration, better is the penetration. Like for example, if I talk about the pilocarpine. So pilocarpine may I have got 1 to 4 percent. We have pilocarpine 1 percent, 2 percent, 3 percent to better penetration I will get with more of the concentration. This is your one thing. Second thing, uh, 
that you can have is the viscosity. So, as I told you that uh, we were having the difference in the viscosity when I was using a drop, I was using a ointment, I was using a gel. So, when I am adding this methyl cellulose, polyvinyl alcohol, they are actually increasing the concentration. Why they are increasing the concentration? Because they are increasing the contact time. Which contact time? With the cornea. So, uh, you know anteriorly we have got the cornea so when I am instilling the drug and it is viscous it is having more contact time is more of uh, contact with the cornea and therefore it will alter the corneal epithelium. Another important thing uh, which will actually affect the penetration is your is the lipid solubility. Why actually it is uh, influenced by the lipid solubility because we have lipids in the epithelium, right? So, obviously because I have lipids there, so higher the lipid solubility, more is the penetration, okay? Then another important thing is whether it is empipathic or not, empipathic. Uh, means uh, penetrating the epithelium or the endothelium, then it is penetrating the stroma or not, whether it is hydrophilic or it is um, not, it is lipophilic or not, it is uh, endo, uh, penetrating the endothelium, epithelium. So, all these factors will obviously uh, alter the concentration and the penetration of the drug which is going inside. Now, let us talk about the other things which are going to influence. The another important thing is the surfactants, okay. Now, what happens? The preservative, most of the time obviously the drugs that uh, we are using in the form of drops, in the form of gels, in the form of ointments there are preservatives in them okay so these preservatives are doing what they alter the cell membrane in the cornea and increase the drug permeability now from now on do one thing whenever you use any eye drop i think this is the commonest eye preparation everybody has one or two eye uh, drops available at home maybe a simple tobramycin or uh, you know at tears eco tears any uh, lubricating eye drop uh, always try to read the constituents and there you will get that in the preservative section we have the benzoconium and thiomersol. So, these actually preservatives they are used in the ocular preparations, they are altering the cell membranes and they are increasing the drug permeability. Okay. Now, the second important thing is the pH. What is the normal pH of the tears? That is your 7.4. So, what will happen if you are using the drug which is having a very, very different pH? So, there will be reflex watering or reflex tearing. You must have seen that some of the drugs causes a lot of tingling and um, there is a so much of tearing when you instill it. So, that is due to the difference in the pH. Another important thing is the drug tonicity. Drug tonicity means what? Now, when uh, what you are doing, you are using an alkaloid drug, okay, which is uh, used in a relatively alkaloid medium, the proportion of the unchanged form will increase and what will happen? Therefore, it will penetrate more. So, there are so many factors actually when uh, that is why we have so many standards for the passage of the drug, for the approval of the drug. So, it has to pass all these factors only then drugs becomes FDA approved to be used there. All right. Now, coming to the topical. So, one by one we will be discussing. Let us talk about the topical drugs first. I think topical is uh, the simplest form of uh, the preparation and most convenient form of preparation and mainly we are using it for the daytime use because nighttime it is not very convenient to instill the drug again and again. Now, another important thing is that the one drop contains just the 50 microliter. One drop contains 50 microliter and usually I have seen patients instilling two, three drops. They think that one drop will be highly, highly insufficient but it is completely wrong. Now, if you look at the capacity of the conjunctival sac, it is just 7 to 13 microliter. Now, can you compare here instead of 50 microns, it is just 7 to 13 microliter. That means even one drop is not going to be absorbed fully because it does not have the capacity. One drop has 50 microliter and that the uh, drop that can go in the conjunctival sac is just 10 microliter if I go with the average. So, a very, very important thing is that even one drop is more than enough. So, 
keep this in um, your mind always try to explain it to your uh, parents also your friends your colleagues your siblings that even one drop is more than sufficient because uh, most of the time uh, you know they uh, do feel that one drop is not sufficient okay then let me to, uh, tell you the important way the right way of instilling this drop so what you are going to do uh, i'll show you the picture also see what you have to do you have to hold this conjunctival sec with the help of uh, maybe the index finger you can uh, stretch it okay so after stretching it you have to actually pull it forward so that you know pouch kind of thing is formed something like this and now it's very easy to instill it i, I think it will be better shown here so we can pull it here we can make a pouch and we can instill the drug this is the proper technique and ideally uh, one should keep the eyes closed for five minutes after instilling the drug so that better absorption can take place all right so see in the measures to increase the drug absorption wait five to ten minutes between the drops and those who have taken the prescription from me i hope uh, you must have been remembering this because many of the students come after the classes that i always say uh, wait for at least 10 minutes before you instill another drug because you know uh, there is capacity of the conjunctival sac is so less even one drop that you have instilled may not have gone inside and by the time you instill another one so the first one will all come out so you should be patient enough when you are dealing uh, with the topical drugs and very slightly very calmly you have to instill the drug wait for 5 to 10 minutes close your eyes and um, you can also uh, this uh, compress the lacrimal sac to increase the absorption you can keep your eyelids closed for five minutes and then you have to instill the drug so these are you know tiny things little little things which actually increases the absorption of the drug and i think oh, not only the medicos also the non-medicos should know all these things so we have to increase the awareness among uh, the people so that they uh, kind of you know, uh, use the drugs in a right manner okay now coming to the ointments if i i talk about the ointments ointments are increasing the content time right of the ocular uh, medication to the surface that means increase contact time with the cornea but the, as i told you before also the vision blurring is a side effect so it's very cumbersome if you have to use these ointments during the uh, daytime another important thing is that these drugs has to be highly lipid soluble with very very little water solubility so in comparison to the water solubility the lipid solubility should be very very high in cases of ointments so i hope you people are listening well and these are the practical things which are expected to be asked in your neat pg 2021 all right now see how to apply the ointment again you will have to stretch the lower lid okay and you have to use it directly don't apply it on the hands we have to use it uh, with the aseptic measures and uh, you also have to um, you know tell the patient how much of it is applied so we usually tell ki ek chawal ke dane jitna usko apply karna hota hai as much as a piece of one rice so that patients could know actually how much quantity they should use right okay now we come to the periocular injections periocular injections now uh, when we feel that we have to go behind the iris lens diaphragm so that time we cannot you know rely upon the topical drugs because these topical drugs are not going behind the iris lens diaphragm so uh, here we can use different kind of injections the subconjunctival septinon peribulbar retrobulbar i have to you know uh, give the drugs which are acting on the posterior sides and topical drugs will hardly do it so this route <coughs> bypasses the conjunctival and corneal epithelium which is good for the drugs with a lower lipid solubility because those drugs which were having the higher lipid solubility were having the close contact with the cornea increased contact time was there then uh, we can also use the steroids and the local anesthetics so i think everybody knows that we are using the local anesthetics with the peribulbar injections with the retrobulbar injections steroids we are giving as the injections uh, after the uh, uh, intraocular uh, surgeries we are giving so the this is a case 
again I think a common root that we are using in day to day ophthalmology practice. Now first we will concentrate on the periocular injection. So we were having three or four types of periocular injections, we will take them one by one. The first one was your subconjunctival. Okay, now there are certain drugs whose particle size is pretty pretty large. Okay, so because of that it cannot penetrate the cornea. Okay, so what we can do if they are not able to penetrate the cornea, we can use the sclera. This will penetrate the sclera. Then second important thing is your subtenon. Subtenon. Subtenon means uh, above the sclera and beneath the tenon. Tenon is a capsule all around the eyeball. Okay, and uh, if you uh, see the shape of your eyeball, it is something like this. It is something like this. So we have an equator here. We have an equator here right this hole is a equator so it could be anterior to the equator it could be posterior to the equator anterior to the equator will be your anterior subtenon while posterior to the equator will be posterior subtenon in this way you can go then the next one is your retrobulbar retrobulbar um, you have heard about the retrobulbar uh, anesthesia then you have also heard about the retrobulbar Optic neuritis, yes, in the optic neuritis. So, uh, in th uh, that terms, we can use. See, they have given you all the three types optic neuritis, papillitis, posterior uveitis. Then, we can also use the anesthesia, retrobulba blocks. Now, they are obsolete, and uh, mostly we are going with the peribulba, but it could be there. And obviously, nowadays, the most important thing that we are using is the peribulba anesthesia. So, the application where they can be used, I think, is very, very clear. All right. Okay, now we will talk about the intraocular injections when you are giving the injections per se inside the eye. So, we have an anterior segment, we have a posterior segment, anterior segment may we have an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber and then we have a vitreous cavity. So, we can divide it into intracameral and intravitreal. Okay, so intracameral as I told you we are not using much but uh, still uh, in order to document intracameral acetylcholine we can give during the cataract surgery right while intravitreal we have antibiotics which are given during the end of thelmitis then we are giving the steroids i think we have read this in diabetic retinopathy where you are giving intravitreal steroids trimsinolone we are using for the macular edema intravitreal anti vegf agents also we are using for diabetic retinopathy so this was again an important question in the previous exams also that to be, uh, they used to ask that which of the following drugs can be given by the intravitreal route so all except kind of a question could also be asked there. All right. Now we come to the sustained release devices. So another thing that we can use in the eyes is the sustained release devices and the advantage is these are actually sustained release, sustained release. So they are actually responsible for maintaining a steady state. So you can actually, you know, give a device inside the eye which is releasing the drug at a constant, you know, velocity slowly and gradually. So these are actually used at a number of places like we have Ocucert. Ocucert is delivering the pilocarpine. Then we have got the Timoptic, uh, which is delivering the Timolol, even Gencyclovir um, uh, devices are available collagen shields are available now um, one important entity where we require the sustained release devices are is actually glaucoma glaucoma may uh, we have got the you know diurnal variation of intraocular pressure also and uh, we need to maintain a steady state concentration of drug inside the eye so that wherever you know we feel that IOP is can be more it will keep on suppressing it and that is why we have got Ocucert we have got the uh, this uh, team optic also even uh, other places also use but this is one of the most important all right now we come to the next one now let's discuss the important points regarding the common ocular drugs so what are the drugs uh, that you have studied till now when we read about the ocular diseases i think this is the most common antibiotics uh, think about the ulcers right we had uh, the bacterial corneal ulcer we had the viral corneal ulcer we had the canthamoeba corneal ulcer we had the 
fungal corneal ulcer so we have antibacterial also antivirals also antifungal also then what are the other drugs you are using anti glaucoma drugs you are using then uveitis may what you are using the midriatics and cycloplegics we are using right then posterior segment may steroids we are using anesthets we are using uh, then we have a uh, lot of uh, conjunctivitis the foreign body sensations where you can use the lubricants we can even use the diagnostic drugs you can give the anesthetics and then you have toxicology so this is nothing to cram about just see uh, starting from the first topic to last topic what are the drugs that you read there okay now let's go one by one the first is your antibacterials that is your antibiotics so what are the antibiotics we can use uh, which are available in the form of the eye drops so we have penicillins we have cephalosporin sulfonamides uh, tetracycline is there even chloramphenicols we have aminoglycosides fluoroquinolones we have got vancomycins macrolids and usually uh, when we are giving it for the um, corneal ulcers we are giving the broad spectrum one 45 antibiotics increase concentration uh, which are um, you know activated against both gram positive gram negative aerobic anaerobic so all these kind of drugs we are using and see we are instilling the eye drop when you um, instill the eye drop again you have to keep certain things in uh, mind these eye drops once open once uh, you know broken seals should not be bought and once you are opening the seal uh, you should always write the date upon it because you should uh, you know discard it after 30 days means after opening you should not use it beyond 30 days and always store in a cool dry place you don't have to refrigerate it you don't have to keep it under the direct sunlight when you instill this eye drop it should not be coming in contact with the cornea or any other structure it should be from above so these are again the basic instructions because you know <coughs> in the hospitals um, the nurses will instill the drugs or residents will instill the drug or their attendants but at home obviously all the time they are not in um, you know in, in vigilance and uh, they are instilling the drugs so these basic instructions <clears throat> should always be given to the patients as well as their attendants. Um, now coming to the uh, further details of the antibiotics okay where you are using them so we are using these antibiotics by so many routes like uh, I can use it topically topically I am using these drugs for a lot of bacterial infections for as a profile access also before the intraocular surgeries we are using them then for the oral ones orally uh, whenever you have got the severe infections like we have the preceptal cellulitis we have cellulitis we have got uh, uh, this um, uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis so wherever we have got a lot of infections even in the pre-operative cataract surgery patients we are using both the topical as well as the oral antibiotics not just the topical one because you know we cannot take a chance and uh, as I always say end of um, in the eye is just the end of the eye and uh, nobody wants ever that uh, a surgery which we are doing for the betterment of the visual acuity is landed up in the endophthalmitis. So though the uh, chance of endophthalmitis, the chance of infection is very very less just 0.2 to 0.3 percent but still you know we do not take a chance and we give the antibiotics in all the form. Then we also use intravenously. So orally we are using for the less severe that is your preceptal cellulitis when you have even more severe like uh, orbital cellulitis we can give um, this uh, uh, for the orbital cellulitis we can use it for intravenous and uh, at times you know when we have orbital cellulitis we also give orally an IV because many a times you do not know exactly and you cannot take the chance and you start the empirical treatment. Then uh, we can also use the intravitrally. Now this is very very important I think everybody knows that in the end of thalmitis we start the antibiotics by all the routes oral, topical, systemic, intravitreal, everything intravenous also and uh, the most important out of all of them is the intravitreal and then you wait for 48 to 72 hours if there is no betterment if there is no improvement we go for the vitrectomy all right now uh, see these are the conditions of the eye we have orbital cellulitis we have got endophthalmitis and um, 
uh, I think uh, when you see such kind of uh, questions in the clinical scenarios, you actually jump towards the antibiotics, all right. Now, uh, talking about the specific antibiotic, talking about the specific antibiotic for the uh, organisms. Now, um, at your level, okay, we have discussed that we give um, mixed uh, um, aerobic, anaerobic and uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. But if I talk uh, very, very particularly, so let us talk about the sulfonamides. Now, I think everybody knows from the farmer knowledge what is the mechanism of action. So, we will be just discussing it in uh, brief. So, you know that... Uh, um, there are bacteria which are synthesizing their own folic acid okay and uh, uh, in this PABA is a constituent and this PABA actually has to be taken from medium. So, when uh, we give these uh, sulfonamides what is the mechanism of action they are the analogs of PABA and uh, therefore what they are doing they are you know uh, binding there and due to which PABA is not able to bind and um, you are inhibiting the synthesis of folate. So, basically they are the inhibitors, they are competing it. Now, uh, instead of the PABA, the sulfonamides will go at that place. So, what they are doing is, they are the competitive inhibitors with the PABA and um, uh, the PABA that was required to produce the folic acid which is not being produced now. So, they altered a folate, okay, which is metabolically injurious is there. So, these are actually forming, you know, Instead of uh, the folate, now what is forming when these uh, sulfonamides are combining? So, they form the dry hydrotroic acid which is con conjugating with the glutamic acid to produce the dihydrofolic acid. So, this is actually the metabolically injurious and uh, this is how we are giving. But uh, when you give the sulfonamides, you should be very, very careful because there are so many patients who are actually uh, sensitive to sulfonamides or allergic to sulfonamides and we should not give certain group of drugs. For example, we have got your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. All right. Now, let us talk about the uses. So, where do you give these sulfonamides? Uh, we are giving in the chlamydial infections. Now, chlamydial infections may we have trachoma also that is your uh, blinding trachoma. We have got inclusion conjunctivitis then we are also giving in the toxoplasmosis. So, um, whatever form of uh, conjunctivitis you get, uh, whether you get this uh, kind of uh, panis you are getting and sago grain follicles and the Herbert pits or you get the inclusion conjunctivitis something like this or you are getting the chorioretinitis patch in cases of toxoplasmosis, you are going to think about the sulfonamides. All right. Now, the next important group of drugs is actually the cephalosporin. So, we do often give the cephalosporins for a more important and a more severe kind of uh, infections in ophthalmology, and uh, you know that. Um, these cephalosporins are your bactericidal beta lactam antibiotics and they are derived from the fungus. So, um, these are. Uh, you know, antibiotics are very, very strong, very, very uh, good and effective ones. But the problem is that there is no activity against lame. Lame means L-A-M-E. What is this lame now? So, it is a mnemonic here. We have got uh, what you called as the L for listeria, A for atypicals like mycoplasma, chlamydia, then you have got methicillin resistant, staph aureus and then you have got E that is your enterococci. So, I think this is again an important point where a question could be asked that uh, cephalosporins are not effective. So, only exception is that you have got the ceftobiprol which is actually you know uh, is acting against the methicillin resistant otherwise they are not acting okay now let us quickly see the different category of the drugs we have first generation second generation third fourth and fifth and i think uh, uh, you must be knowing that which of the names of um, the cephalosporins from these different generations you need to learn as far as ophthalmology is concerned i cannot uh, uh, say anyone okay so whatever is important from your pharma perspective or your um, other uh, medicine perspective you can remember remember those names and if at all you remember all then that is the best one okay now coming to this now if you look at uh, the quick review how can you remember so we have first generation second generation and third generation so basically when we have the first generation we are actually using it for gram positive cocci like we have the cefazolone uh, in the second generation we have got uh, for the gram negative like uh, we have got the cefuroxime and for the third generation we, we have got the gram negative this is ceftraxone so basically what we are using most of the time is the third generation that is ceftraxone and 
and uh, whenever you know we uh, start suspecting the endophthalmitis and we are starting the uh, systemic antibiotics till now we have not given the intravitreal you are waiting so it is always safest to start with the third generation that is your ciftraxone all right uh, if I talk about the side effects, they are always there. So, we have allergic reactions, we have neutropenias, the thrombocytopenias. Yes, they are severe, but uh, nevertheless, we do not have choice always, okay. Now, we have the aminoglycosides. So, what is um, they doing? So, aminoglycosides are actually the bacterial protein synthesis inhibitors. So, they are inhibiting the protein synthesis, not able to grow therefore, and uh, that is why they are mainly acting against the gram negative bacilli. So, most of the time what we read in cases of ulcers, we are starting the empirical treatment. Empirical treatment means just you are giving the broad spectrum, both gram positive, gram negative, you are not waiting for the culture reports. Because most of the time patient has already started with some treatment if, and if I want to do the culture, I will have to first stop the drugs for 48 hours, then I will ask the patient to do the culture. and. Um, you know and uh, then we will be coming with the reports and then we start with the treatments so obviously I cannot you know uh, stop the drugs for so much of time and unnecessarily increase the risk that is why we give the empirical treatment but if we do have the time and if you are going with the standard protocol uh, you can give uh, the treatment after the culture and sensitivity so for this we have got uh, what you called as gentamicin 0.3 percent remember the concentration for the simple simple drugs that could be our stobramycin we have got 1 percent and neomycin 0.3 to 0.5 percent. They won't be asking every concentration but yes these basic drugs which are commonly asked it's better you can remember them. Okay. Now uh, the second one is your tetracycline. Tetracycline is again inhibiting the protein synthesis and tetracycline as you know we are using for the chlamydia trachoma also. This is actually both for gram positive and gram negative. We have got fungus and even the chlamydia. Um, in terms of ophthalmology especially important uh, this tetracycline is for the chlamydia where you are also using the single drug regimen like azithromycin. Now another important drug is your chloramphanicol. Chloramphanicol is also inhibiting the protein synthesis. It is a broad spectrum drug and again that is why it is important both tetracycline and chloramphanicol are broad spectrum. They are effective against both gram positive, gram negative as well as chlamydia and they are coming in the percentage of 0.5 percent both the eye drops and ointment. Even uh, once I think they had even asked the question that which of the is available as a drops or ointment. So, uh, at times we are asking such kind of a question, right? Um, now, coming to the antibiotics. Now, uh, if I talk about the trachoma, which is one of the, you know, infection that is causing the leading blindness in India. So, one infection that can be responsible for the blindness is a trachoma and it is the most common infection which is causing blindness in India. It can be treated by the topical and systemic tetracycline. We have erythromycin and as I told you, we also have the single drug regimen. We also have the single drug regimen with the help of systemic azithromycin. Then another important thing is the bacterial keratitis or the bacterial corneal ulcers. When you are treating the bacterial corneal ulcers, we are giving the uh, fortified drugs. Fortified drugs means you are increasing the concentration by adding the injections to it. So, we can use the penicillins, the vancomycin, cephalosporins, uh, aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolone. So, these are the drugs that we are using. But uh, if I talk about the conjunctivitis, so nevertheless conjunctivitis is often less severe in um, in cases of um, in comparison to the keratitis and these infections are usually self-limited but uh, we can use the topical erythromycin again aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, chloramphanicols, same drugs could be used. So, this was about your antibiotics. Now, I am going, uh, you know, in a faster pace, not very, very slowly so that you do not waste much of the time before your NEET PG 2021 and quickly you can go through this video. Now, the second important thing is your antivirals. If I talk about the antivirals, I think you will jump upon acyclovir. So, this is the most common a, uh, antiviral that we do discuss and um, that is your 3%. Uh, so, remember your herpes simplex and herpes zoster. So, herpes simplex and herpes zoster may topical what we are giving is a 3% five times a day and uh, when it comes to herpes zoster where I am using the tablet form, tablet form may it is 800 milligram again five times a day. Even uh, we can also use intravenous for the herpes zoster retinitis. So, you know that herpes simplex, simplex is simple one and zoster is a severe one. So, when it is causing the retinitis, we can even use the intravenous variety. Then uh, apart from this, we have lot of drugs like we have idoxuridine, vidarabine, cytarabine, trifluorthymidine, gancyclovir. But yes, a 
acyclovir and gancyclovir are the most important ones and most of the time the indication is the herpes zoster or we have the viral uveitis there also we can use it. Again they are available in the um, ointment form and in the form of the tablets alright. So, one uh, important form of uh, the viral retinitis is the cytomegalovirus retinitis. Can you see uh, and uh, tell me which kind of uh, retinitis is the cytomegalovirus can be of pizza pie appearance, granular appearance, brush fire kind of appearance. So, can you tell me out of the three which kind? So, this is a question for you write it in the comment section which kind of retinitis is the uh, this uh, CMV retinitis is the most common you know um, retinitis that is occurring in HIV patients. We have got wool spots and this particular one is very very specific for uh, HIV and you have to tell me in the comment section that which kind of retinitis it is all right. Then another kind of uh, viral uh, disease where we can be using the antivirals is the dendritic ulcer. Dendritic ulcer that is very very typical of the herpes simplex uh, typical you know arborizing patterns we can get there. So there also we can use it. Then we have got the antifungals. Now, if I come to the antifungals, antifungals may obviously we have fungal corneal ulcer, we have fungal retinitis and endophthalmitis. Endophthalmitis is again very, very important indication uh, where you are using the antifungals. Um, commonly available are the polyenes, we have imidazoles, flucytosine and uh, I think you must have uh, be remembering that in the fungal corneal ulcers we are using damphotericin B, netamycin, statin. So, what was the drug of choice for your filamentous fungus that was your netamycin. In cases of the yeast like fungus we were using the amphotericin B with the nystatin. Then we have imidazoles like mecanazole, ketonaconazole, fluconazole, we have got the flu cytosine also. So, a lot of drugs are there and uh, this is your typical picture of the fungal corneal ulcer, dry looking grayish uh, with the elevated margins, finger like projections, rolled out edges, multiple satellite lesions and what not. So, if you are getting something like this, think about the fungal corneal ulcer and think about giving the antifungals. Then um, we have got the midriatics and cycloplegics. I think uh, nobody can uh, forget this that this is the treatment of choice of the acute anterior uveitis. We have two things here. One is the midriatics, one is the cycloplegics. Midriatics means they are dilating the pupil. Cycloplegics means paralysis. So basically they are doing two things. They are dilating the pupil. And they are also, you know, uh, giving relax to the ciliary muscle. So, they are actually giving full relief to the ciliary muscle spasm and uh, that is why they are considered to be the drug of choice of acute anterior uveitis. And um, then we have the classifications. So, we have got um, three kind in terms of their uh, classification. We can have short acting, intermediate and long acting. So, you people already know longest acting is your atropine. The duration of action is also longest while shortest acting is the tropicamide intermediate may we have cyclopentolate and homotropine then one uh, which is only a midriatic not a cycloplegic is your phenylephrine so where you are using it you are using it in the uveitis you are also using it in cases of the corneal ulcers in order to give relief to the pain because there is a lot of ciliary muscle spasm then we can also use it for refraction so these are the important indications where you are using the midriatics as well as cycloplegics all right Next is your anti-glaucoma drugs. Now, though we have already uh, taken a separate lecture uh, in our, um, you know, the ophthalmology pharmacology uh, integrated lecture. So, just a brief I will give here. Anti-glaucoma drugs may we have got the beta blockers, we have uh, non-selective timolol, selective one is bituxolol. So, they are actually decreasing the aqueous humor formation and the most important is the timolol, but timolol is actually contraindicated in the cardiopulmonary diseases and there we can give the bituxolol. So, that you know. Now, side effects may there are a lot of side effects and side effects is again important uh, in terms of the questions may bradycardia, A for anxiety, B for bradycardia, you have sweating. Yes, and uh, then you see the ocular may irritation is there, headache, frontal headache, cyst formation can be there, follicular conjunctivitis. So, here you can easily remember it with the A, B, C, D that was your allergic follicular conjunctivitis A, B is for blurring of vision, C is for corneal sensation decrease and D is for dryness. These are very, very important side effects that you are getting with the uh, beta blockers. Okay. Then next one. Next, if you uh, see the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So, you know we have got topical, we have got systemic, topical with dorsolamide, we have brinzolamide, in the systemic we have acetazolamide, methazolamide and they are inhibiting the enzyme carbonic anhydrase and therefore again the 
uh, decrease of the aqueous formation and uh, again lot of side effects we have, we have got paresthesia, lot of uh, 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 increased frequency of urination, GI disturbances is there, we have got the hypokalemia and due to this you know at times the usage of these drugs is also limited. All right. Now, if you go with the hyper uh, osmotic agents, we know that uh, mannitol or um, acetazolamide are there. But if I talk about the um, uh, mannitol, which are the hyper osmotic agents, uh, sorry, in the hyper osmotic agents, we do not have acetazolamide. But in the emergency cases, we use both mannitol and acetazolamide. Now, when it comes to the mannitol, it is very, very important because, you know, it's a diuretic. It is not an anti-glaucoma drug per se. It is just, you know, shifting the fluid from the vitreous cavity to the ECF so that temporarily we are bringing the uh, intraocular pressure low. So, it's a very good drug when you have to immediately decrease the intraocular pressure from a very high level. So, there you can use it. But of course, uh, it has a side effect because it is causing the volume overload. It is shifting the fluid. So, because of that volume overload, it is contraindicated in those conditions where we already have the volume overload. Uh, it could be your uh, renal failure. It could be your uh, heart failure. So, you will not use it. So, what is the drug of choice? Uh, if I talk about the drug of choice, we know it is the prostaglandins, especially the latinoprost and remember the concentration point 005 percent. It is actually increasing the uveoscleral outflow. Uh, it is a good drug, but again we have got lot many uh, side effects. We have already discussed the side effects, the intraocular inflammation, hypertrichosis, uh, we have trichomegaly, we have got pigmentations, we have got cysts. So, all these things are there and that is why its usage is again limited. So, uh, this was about the anti-glaucoma drugs. Now, we come to the anti-inflammatory drugs. Again, uh, we cannot, you know, underestimate the importance of the anti-inflammatory drugs because there are lot many diseases in the eye which are having the inflammation. So, if you see here, uh, we can divide these anti-inflammatory drugs broadly into two categories. We have got the good steroids and uh, because, you know, steroids is a double-edged sword, we can use it uh, many places while we are also having the side effect at many places. So, we also have the second choice which is your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, these uh, steroids again can be divided into short acting, intermediate acting and long acting. Uh, I think you must have uh, learned this in your pharma. Again, this is uh, important because I have again seen time and again they are asking the question on steroids regarding their potency, regarding their efficacy, regarding their um, side effects also. So, when it comes to short acting, we have got what? We have got the the hydrocortisone when we have cortisone and prednisolone, right. Then if I talk about the intermediate, we have got two. One is trimsinolone, one is the flu prednisolone. While if I am talking of the long acting, that is your, the ones uh, that we are using in obzengine, that is your dexamethasone and betamethasone. Now, if you go to the relative potency. So, relative potency may I have used this table from the Parsons, which is available in chapter number uh, 10, okay. So, um, you can see this and uh, I won't be reading everything here but yes if you see here the comparison is very very important because at times they will give you four drugs from this and they say which one of the least uh, them is least potent or having the most potency most anti-inflammatory effect uh, least side effect so you should know this order and specially important is the fluoromethylone dexamethylone lotipridnol prednisolone betamethasone hydrocortisone I won't say that others are not important but these uh, many drugs are very very important because of their maximum usage so you should know the comparative efficacy of these drugs and you should also remember that the least potent is the fluoromethylone and that is why it has the least of the side effects and that is why uh, you know whenever we require the steroids in the ophthalmology we do actually begin with this fluoromethylone all right now, indications are too many starting from the topical you are using for every kind of inflammation, allergic conjunctivitis, scleritis, uveitis, uh, keratitis and then when you are having a lot of surgeries, we do require for the inflammation. Uh, when you have got the systemic, systemic uh, we will use when we cannot uh, benefit the patient with the topical drug. So, when it is behind the lens like uh, uh, posterior uveitis, we have optic neuritis and then very important thing is the rejection. There you have to give it. All right. So, never give steroids. I think uh, this is not complete without giving you this statutory warning that never give steroids if you are 
suspecting some active infection. Uh, if you are not giving steroid at one place, that could be forgiven. But if you are giving a steroid at one place where infection is there or could be there, that will not be forgiven. So, we have got so many things. Uh, it could be a case of allergic conjunctivitis where you are giving the steroids. Uh, it could be a case of episcleritis where you are giving the steroids. Then we have the anterior uveitis where you are giving the steroids. Uh, yes, we have a lot of contraindication and as I say contraindications are always more important in comparison to the indications. Uh, we have fungal infections, uh, glaucomas because you know um, that uh, we have got the GTCS means topical steroids can induce the glaucoma. So, in glaucoma whenever you have epithelial defect they can penetrate. Uh, we have herpetic epithelial keratitis, even systemic because you know they are a lot of complications of the steroids. They are in causing the hyperglycemia, they are causing the osteoporosis. So, all these places we are not giving them, uh, they can induce ulcers, they can precipitate the ulcers. When and then you have got you know uh, end organ damage, heart failure, renal failure. So again you know these are your um, uh, integrated things where uh, ophthalmology, pharmacology, medicine all these things could be asked in an integrated fashion. Okay. Now, if you come to the ocular side effects, yes, I told you we have GTCS, topical steroids causes more of glaucoma, systemic steroids causes more of cataract, uh, more chances of infection, they will delay the wound healing and that is the reason that we are not giving them in glaucoma, we are not uh, giving them for long term in any patient, we do not want to give it an infection or because it uh, delays the healing and all these things. Now, at all the, the places where you know steroids are contraindicated, there we can go with this anesthetics, or you feel that um, even it will be treated by the anesthetics, it is not that severe, there also you can start with this. So, topically, what are the anesthetics we, uh, we can use? We have the flurbiprofen, we have endomethacin, we have ketorolec, all these drugs are also you know used in cases of allergic. Uh, conjunctivitis, we endomethacin we are using for CME, uh, we can uh, use it for episcleritis, scleritis, uveitis, steroid meculoridema is very very important and in every case of uh, cataract surgery many consultants prefer to give endomethacin uh, SR that is sustained release uh, in every case so that we can avoid the risk of cystoid macular edema. Then we also we give preoperatively before the cataract surgery in order to maintain the dilatation of the pupil and preservative will be same that is your benzaconium chloride. Now, these are the important concentrations of the drugs which are actually used. Um, if you go with the topical drugs, uh, we have got uh, uh, the endomethacine that is your 0.1 percent. I hope it, it is visible. Then we have flurbiprofen 0.3 percent, ketorololac 0.5 percent, diclofenac 0.1 percent. Uh, 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 do not learn these because um, at your level, I think these many are. Uh, okay okay otherwise you won't be able to learn any of them then we come to the systemic one systemic may uh, most of the names uh, you know i think paracetamol diclofenac acyclofenac ketorolac ibuprofen flurbiprofen naproxen mifenamic acid so i think you already know this the next is your ocular lubricants. Now, though you know uh, lubricants are not um, very serious kind of drugs, but certainly in eye they play a very very major role and we are giving them an ocular irritation, dry eye. Uh, so many commercially available tear substitutes are there and I think all of you should keep uh, one uh, eye drop handy because all of us are having so much of screen time especially uh, when our exams are so near. So they are available in the form of refresh tears, tear plus, moisol, ocuvet, uh, gentile, eco tears, uh, add tears. I think uh, the very very fancy names are uh, there and uh, we are using the uh, preservative also in the stabilized oxychloro complex here. Now next we will take with the ocular diagnostic drugs. Now after you have seen the therapeutics mostly the drugs that we are using for the therapeutic purposes the drugs are uh, there in the eye which we are using for the diagnostic purpose also. So one very very important drug I will not say drug actually it is a dye. So, we are using the fluorescein dye uh, in the form of drops or we have got the strips which are impregnated uh, with the fluorescein dye and that is basically 2 percent sodium salt. I think this is one of the dyes that we are using most commonly in the ophthalmology for staining the corneal abrasions. Then we are using it in the applanation tonometry when you get the myers for uh, detecting any the, of the wound leak you are using it uh, for the sigils test we are using it. 
then we are using it for any NLD obstruction, Jones dye test may we are using it and you are also using it for the angiography. I think this is an amazing uh, question as a short note also for your internal exams as well as obviously it is important for your NEET PG. Well, one of the important things is that you have to take certain caution because it stains the uh, contact lens then fluorescein uh, drops can be contaminated with the pseudomonas. So, every time you are using something in the eye the you know risk of um, contamination is always very very high. Then uh, if you see here uh, these are the examples when we have stained the ulcers with the fluorescein you have got fluorescein angiography right. Then uh, another dye is your rose bengal stain. This is actually staining the devitalized epithelium and the dose that we are using is 1 percent. What are the uses? The use is very very important. You are using it in a very very dry eye and also in herpetic keratitis. Now if you remember we have got the dendritic pattern there. So, what is happening in the dendritic pattern? We have got tree like arborizing pattern along with the knobs, something like this. So, you have got two things here. One thing is uh, the knobs here, these are called as the knobs, and uh, this is actually called as the floor. So, both the places are actually dyed uh, with a separate stain. For the knobs, we are using this rose Bengal dye, while F for F, so F for floor, floor is stained with the fluorescein dye with a simple mnemonic that F for floor, F for the fluorescein dye you can use, and the knobs are uh, by the rose bengal stain they can be stained. Now uh, coming up to the anesthetic. So, first we take with the local anesthetic. So, local anesthetics may uh, we are using the um, topical drugs like we have got the proparacaine, tetracaine and uh, there are a lot of uses. I think so many procedures you have already learned where we are using these anesthetics um, like in applanation tonometry, gonioscopies, uh, when you want to remove the foreign bodies, when you want to remove the sutures. Um, then uh, there are certain patients who do not actually you know cooperate or their pain threshold is very very less. They are not able to open up their eyes because of pain and uh, there are a lot of adverse effects. Obviously, you cannot uh, take it for granted. Uh, it can be toxic to epithelium and we can have the allergic reaction. So, you do not actually overuse it. Um, Coming up with the orbital infiltration, we can have peribulbar or retrobulbar. It is causing anesthesia as well as the akinesia. And what we are using, uh, very, very common uh, solutions, lidocaine 2 percent, bupivacaine 0 0.5 percent. I think this combination is a very, very, you know, standard combination. And you should know the name of the drugs along with their concentration, 2 percent lidocaine and 0 0.5 percent bupivacaine. All right. Now, if you look at the pictures, this is your orbital infiltration and um, uh, you know that uh, we have got two kind of anesthesias, one is your peribulbar, one is your retrobulbar. So, accordingly we are using the injections, if you are using the peribulbar, we have to use two, one on the upper eyelid, one in the lower eyelid. If you are giving the retrobulbar, then we have got a single one. Uh, Coming to the ox, uh, ocular toxicology last but not the least and uh, we have got you know complications of topical administration we have and mostly the questions also are asked from this like uh, we can have one very important thing we can have the mechanical injury from the bottle now these are the things uh, which are accidental and we do not uh, think about them but they are very very common when you are instilling the drug and you are uh, end up rubbing that tip of the bottle to the cornea there can be corneal abrasions. Then as far as the epinephrine is concerned, pigmentation is very, very common. Uh, there could be damage with the topical anesthetics. We can have hypersensitivity. So, hypersensitivity ke liye atropine, uh, neomycin, gentamicin, this is very, very common. Then we have the systemic uh, effects like topical phenylephrine can increase the BP. Again, a very, very important thing because many times uh, students do ask us that um, uh, can hypertensive people take phenylephrine? So, no uh, means... Uh, uh, most of the time we think that the topical drug will not have any effect on systemic hypertension but this is one drug which is a severe vasoconstrictor and that is why if you remember I told you this in uh, the refraction also that uh, if a person is having a systemic hypertension don't give phenylephrine we give only the uh, tropicamide. Then uh, talking about the amidron or amidron is one drug which is frequently asked. So, I think anything which is related with amidron is important. So, this is a cardiac arrhythmia drug and uh, you know it uh, as 
as a cause of optic neuritis, it is causing the visual field defects, it is causing the bilateral optic disc edema. Then uh, you also know as one of the drugs in a pica, what was pica? Do you remember? Pica, pica was the drugs which were causing the vortex keratopathy. We were having this. Um, phenothiazines, intomethacine, C for chloroquine and A for amidron. So, this A for amidron is also responsible for your vortex keratopathy. Uh, amidron is important as a cause of optic neuritis. Amidron is also important as a cause of cornea verticillata, right? Uh, this is your cornea verticillata. Can you see the vertical striations? These are the whirl-like deposits which are present on the epithelium and uh, this person mostly is either asymptomatic or may have some amount of glare. That can be uh, due to this um, deposits on the uh, on the epithelium so that is called as cornea verticillata right then another important drug is a digitalis now digitalis is one drug which is very very important as far as your uh, cardiovascular system is concerned in the medicine in the pharma and uh, it actually causes the chromatopsia so yellow colored vision and many of times i bet you you will be able to solve this question because of this yellow colored vision uh, they will give you a long clinical question and then they say that they will end up giving one drug which is causing the yellow color vision and you just know that it is digitalis right Okay. Next is your chloroquine. Now, chloroquine, I think, is a talk of the town. Uh, last from the uh, starting from your last year, and uh, there are so many questions which have been asked related to it. We have chloroquine, we have hydroxychloroquine, and uh, I took a separate, you know, uh, session on your uh, bullseye maculopathy. Also, I think that is again very important uh, because um, bullseye maculopathy is important, and nowadays chloroquine and hydrochloroquine is important. So we can get a question related to it, and you know, it is used in malaria rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, so many of the orthopedicians, uh, physicians, they are using it and chloroquine can cause uh, the vortex keratopathy, chloroquine can also cause bullseye maculopathy, so I will not go into the details here because we have uh, separately given you bullseye maculopathy, right? So, this is the uh, standard lesion which is also called as the annular benign concentric macular dystrophy and or the bullseye maculopathy which is caused by both chloroquine as well as hydroxychloroquine. So, do remember you have to learn everything about it. Uh, we have discussed it before, right? Then the next important drug is the chlorpromazine which is a psychiatric drug. Now, here we can have a question which is uh, integrated between the ophthalmology as well as psychiatry. They, uh, they can give you a question that all of the following drugs can be causing the posterior subcapsular cataract except a person having psychiatric illness because a psychiatric illness person may be ha having the chlor. Uh, chlorpromazine and this chlorpromazine actually is responsible for causing the anterior subcapsular cataract and not the posterior subcapsular cataract. So, it is causing the punctate epithelial opacities on the cornea, on the lens also. So, it is ASC, anterior subcapsular cataract, really it is symptomatic and an important thing is that it is reversible with the discontinuation. So, when you are, uh, you know, giving uh, this chloroquine, to a person and it is causing the retinopathy that is not reversible. When you are giving chloroquine and it is causing the keratopathy that is cornea verticillata that is reversible. Similarly, when you are giving the chlorpromazine and uh, it is causing these punctate opacities, it is also reversible. Then the next important drug is your thioridazine which is also a psychiatric drug and this is very important in terms of your salt and pepper retinitis. So, salt and pepper retinitis is again an important uh, DD that could be asked and uh, out of all the causes, if I talk about the drugs, then phenothiazine, thioridazine, this is important drug that is causing your salt and pepper retinitis. It looks something like this. Can you see? We have got black and white mottling of the retina that resembles your salt and pepper appearance. Then the next important drug is the ethambutol that you are using as a ATT. It causes a dose related optic neuropathy. Now, I think everybody knows that it causes the optic neuritis, optic neuropathy, but you should know that that is causing dose related optic neuropathy and it is reversible. Most of the time it is reversible. Occasionally, you know, permanent visual damage can take place, but mostly it is reversible.